Okay, whenever you're ready, Graham. Hey. Hello, and a big welcome to Biotensegrity Tea Party number 32, brought to you by the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive, where today we are focusing on the second part of the Anatomy and Movement series featuring Neil Galloway and Jennifer Wilson. My name is Graham Scar, coming to you from Robin Hood country in the UK, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Clancy from Deep Cove near Vancouver. Give us a wave, Chris. Hi, Graham. Hi. Also our technical team who are busy pulling strings and winding up the clockwork motors that make all this happen, Rachel Tudor outside Olympia, Washington. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Graham. Hi, everyone. Lisa Babiuk in St. Albert, Alberta. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Graham. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. And Mariana Barreto from Mississauga near Toronto. Give us a wave, Mariana. Our usual co-host, Susan Lolder Solorsano, is unable to join us today as she has been talking to another group elsewhere. So thanks, chaps, and we are now almost ready to begin. But before we start, let's break open the champers with a toast from one of our guests, Jen Wilson. Thank you, Graham. So I'd like to raise a toast to everyone who's joined us today and is contributing to growing the field of biotensegrity and helping us get that knowledge out to the general public as well. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Well, thanks, Jen. And we can now hear something about our sponsors who helped to keep this show on the road. So take it away, Chris. Thanks, Graham. So the Biotensegra Tea Party is an all-volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive, and it's made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. And right from day one, Handspring Publishing of East Lothian, Scotland, has been with us sponsoring the, the Biotensegra Tea Parties. They are our publishers. They produce books, highly accessible books for movement and manual therapy professionals. And they also offer a generous discount to those of you who are here on Zoom. So uh, one of our tech team will put the link for that coupon into the Zoom chat. I encourage you to use it. Uh, Susan Lowell's book is now out. Neil has a book. Graham has a book with them and there's lots of, and Elizabeth Larkham also has a book with them. Elizabeth is uh, hosting their Move to Learn series. And you can find out more about that on the Handspring Publishing website. There'll also be a link for that in the chat box. The Biotense Sacred Tea Party is also sponsored by Artifact Pro of Madrid, Spain, where you can find wonderfully constructed anatomical tensegrity models. Uh, Artifact Pro is also offering us a generous discount. And so go on and sit, go on to their website, take a look at their beautiful models. We're also kindly supported by the British Fascist Symposium in the UK. And they have just launched an exciting new program under the banner of Fascia Hub. And I don't know if we've got that link yet set up, but I took a look yesterday and it's Fascia Hub dot fascial with an L hub.com uh, starting Saturday, November 28th. They've got a full day talk on the fascial pelvis. Neil, I think you're going to be there for that. Aren't you? And also yes, yes, that's correct, Chris. Yeah. So that'll be great. Also the integrated biotensegrity. This is Lisa's project out of Canada, Alberta. And uh, she is hosting a full day course on November 7th with Lisa Babia, which is, you're here, your camera's off with Rachel Tudor. Rachel, can you give us a wave? And also Paul Thornley, who's all, often here with us. I don't see him right now yet. And they will put the link for that as well into the chat. Thanks guys. Finally, uh, Embody Biotensegrity is the platform that I'm running and I've also been here a sponsor from the very beginning. Right now, we're offering a discount for Biotensegrity Trailblazers, especially for those of you who want to take part in the pilot project that uh, we are running with, um, ah, there goes a blank, <laughs> with Tens Biolat. And we're going to be creating some amazing uh, Tensegrity sculptures and 
and uh, you can check them out, uh, Tea Party number 30. And their workshop is only open for trailblazers. And if you are already a biotensegrity trailblazer and you want to join in, you need to register by Sunday because we've got to get all the uh, struts made. Okay, so with that, let's get on with the show. Graham, back to you. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, now, as Chris said, we've started the main part of the show. So we ask all members of the audience to turn off your mics and videos so that uh, it keeps the uh, whatever it is we have to keep running smoothly. So let me introduce our first guest, which is uh, Neil Galloway, is a surgeon and associate professor of urology in Atlanta, Georgia, who has worked extensively in the areas of clinical evaluation and surgical treatments for congenital and acquired defects of pelvic support anatomy and urogenital anomalies. And he's been active in applying the principles of biotensegrity to pelvic reconstructive surgery for vaginal prolapse and incontinence. And our second guest is Jennifer Wilson, who is a sports therapist and coach at Derby University in the UK and just completed her PhD. She recently published a paper on biotensegrity entitled The Multifunctional Foot and Athletic Movement, Extraordinary Feats from Our Extraordinary Feet. So welcome, Neil and Jennifer. Thank you very much. Uh, we are all very interested to learn some of what Jen can tell us about fabulous feet. And uh, Jennifer, I'd like to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just bring this PowerPoint up for everyone. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone should be able to see that now. Yes, that's good. Great, uh, okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk in today's uh, Biotensegrity Tea Party. Um, luckily for me, I uh, really enjoy talking about the foot because I think it's one of the uh, most extraordinary structures we have um, uh, within the body. And I don't profess to be an expert in the topic, uh, but I look forward to any questions that might come from the discussion today. Um, and I suppose the approach I've taken to the discussion today is to base it on running. So by all means, if there's any terminology that anyone is unsure about, or um, if we discuss anything to do with running that people would like more context about, then just please ask away or we can go through um, at the end. So I suppose if we if we look at what running is, running is really distinguishable from uh, walking patterns via its uh, flight phase. However, there's been some more recent research um, uh, to do with a new form or a, uh, a new classification of running called grounded running, which is essentially uh, contains many of the characteristics of, of running, but we don't have the distinguishable flight phase. And that changes our relationship with force. And I thought that's worth mentioning because I know Susan has previously done, um, done a talk on ground reaction forces. And I actually think our interaction with force is quite important, which we're gonna to come to a little bit later. There is an assumption that running is a non-skilled movement because we learn it when we're young and then we carry it through into our adult lives. But actually there's, there's quite a high amount of skill involved in running, particularly if you are someone who runs recreationally or runs competitively. Um, and we can hone that skill as well. We can teach the skill. A lot of what I do is about assessing people's running ability or uh, running quality and then making changes to that running pattern to decrease injury risk or enhance someone's performance. In the current literature surrounding running, we quite often talk about uh, running gait being like a spring mechanism versus walking, which is considered to be more of a pendulum motion. And for those of you who uh, joined us in the last um, Biotensegra Tea Party that I did, we spoke a lot about a concept in um, strength and conditioning in particular around stiffness and elastic recoil. Um, because essentially 
the most efficient runners are those that make use of their elasticity or um, tension within the system to get a return of energy. Um, and this for me is where biotensegrity really comes into its own because I think the current sort of terminology within strength and conditioning surrounded, surrounding stiffness and elastic recoil actually corresponds with what we're talking about in um, biotensegrity. And that's really what led me to the point of discussing it in my thesis. Um, there are also questions surrounding our relationship with force and injury risk. And for those of you who work uh, with injury uh, rehabilitation, or if you're working with patients who are maybe returning from injury, you might have come across a lot of literature concerning uh, the, the negative impact of high uh, ground reaction forces or high impact forces. And actually, um, the more I have moved into research and the more I've sort of dug into my thesis, the more I'm of the opinion that high ground reaction forces or high impact forces aren't necessarily um, an issue. It's how we mitigate those forces or how we manage those forces that becomes significant to injury risk. And again, I'll, I'll discuss more of that um, in a little while. So as I said, we assume that running is a skill that we have, that we, we learn when we're little and then we maintain. Um, but actually, it's a skill you can develop. And unfortunately, one of the things that um, is uh, interesting within running and injury risk is the more you run, so your training age doesn't necessarily protect you from injury. Again, there's, a, there's an assumption that you run more, you get fitter, you become more resilient, and therefore you're not predisposed to injury. But that's not the case at all. A lot of what predisposes us to injury is well, it's a, it's a myriad of risk factors. So how we, like I said, how we uh, mitigate force, how we manage forces, but that might be based on the quality of our movement, coupled with fatigue, coupled with previous injury history. So your training age doesn't necessarily make you a better runner, nor does it make you less predisposed to injury. And that was a real like aha moment for me because that made me realize that just because someone has experience in something doesn't mean they're skilled. However, there is um, definitely a class of runners who have developed the skills, the skills and the variability to exploit a bandwidth of movement options and therefore are able to manage and mitigate impact forces more proficiently. So to give you some context on that, we have movement options, um, and this is often uh, known as, as variability and I always think about variability operating within a bandwidth where if you have too many movement options the joints are essentially um, to want of a better word unstable um, and you're more predisposed to injury risk. This is common in our new learners who are trying to uh, uh, sort of ingrain a movement skill or a, a movement pattern. We then have too narrow bandwidth or uh, too little and this also predisposes us to injury because what it means is if I'm subject to um, perturbation I don't have the movement options to cope with that disruption. The more proficient uh, runners or the more proficient skilled runners have this really lovely amount of variability, which means they're able to cope with varying demands and changes in terrain and little nuances in their movement patterns when they experience fatigue. Um, so this is a really important concept to us because I think from my perspective as a practitioner, what we're trying to do is ensure that people move well enough that they can exploit that, um, that movement variability, particularly in, in running. So the reason I um, was brought to the, the, the foot in the first place is based on our evolutionary history, the foot is really an evolutionary masterpiece. Um, and you know, from an architectural standpoint, it really is a fantastic uh, subsystem of, of joints or structures. And there were a few key changes that occurred within the foot um, that contributed to our ability to, uh, to become uh, long distance runners. And those uh, primarily feature around the development of the foot arch and the long Achilles tendon, shortening of the toes. And um, we also had coupled with things like lengthening of the legs, uh, development of our large gluteal muscles, which um, are our power muscles. And then things like enhanced mobility in the thoracic spine. But some of the changes that occurred within the foot and subsequently what the foot does in running, for me, 
really make it a huge contributor to running performance or running ability. Um, and even more so, a lot of the changes that occurred occurred within tissues that contribute to things like elastic energy storage. So for example, the structure of the foot arch, uh, arch the structure of the Achilles tendon is almost integral to um, elastic recoiling and giving us energy in return. Um, and things like shortening of the toes and therefore the toe flexes, again, very important to providing us with stability, but also important to uh, navigating the forward propulsion of the limbs. So contributes to stability, but also contributes to tensioning that nice chain of, um, of tissues within the lower limb as well. So um, one of the questions that frequently comes up uh, from my paper is this idea about nearly decomposable versus decomposable. And I suppose the reason um, I wanted to go through this is the foot is this, uh, as I said, this really magnificent um, structure that contrib contributes grossly to uh, key movement skills like running, but it's part of a large chain of joints or a large series of joints. Um, and one of the things that I wrote about in the paper that's uh, been published is the idea about it being part of a nearly decomposable structure. So um, essentially this comes from uh, early complexity theory where um, Simon talks about a nearly decomposable system, which is one where there's interaction among subsystems, uh, sub which is weak but not, uh, not negligible. And I think you know, one of the things that we discussed the last time um, I was lucky enough to be part of the parties is that, well, the relationship between the foot and other, the other joints in the, um, in the lower limb system isn't, it's not weak, it has quite a significant interaction. Um, and again, we'll come, uh, we'll come on to that a little bit uh, later. But a fully decomposable system is one that's more like a mechanical system where everything has a really tightly designated role. And the reason this featured as part of my um, thesis is it was a precursor to a discussion about degeneracy. But one of the key points that I wanted to pick from this is that the relationship between joints of the lower limbs, so the foot, the knee, the ankle, et cetera, is functional. There's meaningful interaction between parts, but then each part can also do its own independent role. But whatever that independent role is impacts um, joints higher or uh, above and below that joint series as well. So in short, the behavior of individual components is immediately independent, yet also fully integrated, which I think is a really nice way to describe what we would consider to be the kinetic chain system. The other question that frequently comes up um, from my paper is degeneracy um, and degeneracy ultimately describes collective behaviours or um, parts of the body that can modify their behaviours to fulfil a similar outcome. Um, so with uh, nearly decomposable systems versus uh, composable systems, what I always think of is uh, fairy lights around a Christmas tree. So ultimately, if you have all those fairy lights, they can act independently. But if one isn't quite fit, then the whole system essentially breaks down. And that's the analogy that always comes to my head when I think about that relationship between parts. They can function independently, but they also function collectively as well. Um, and degeneracy, uh, degeneracy ultimately affords us that ability to manage disruption, perturbations, by modifying behaviors or modifying the behaviors of structures to fulfill a similar outcome. So there's more than one way to skin a cat, for example. Um, within the foot, we have multiple ways to reach the same outcome or to fulfill particular um, behaviors through interactions of various tissues. Um, so again, we think about um, uh, the function of muscles we can have muscles that let's again just for uh, simplicity have muscles that act as primary movers but then can also contribute to similar actions elsewhere um, and it's, just, it's the same with the foot we have a number of tissues and layers of tissues within the foot that can function independently and fulfill a primary role 
but then can also um, fulfill a secondary role if necessary. And that's really what degeneracy is. It's about multiple uh, tissue configurations or multiple joint structures fulfilling the same or similar outcomes when necessary. Hopefully that's clarified that a little bit. There is some really great papers um, by Whitaker that I can send the links for um, and hopefully someone can share those um, in the chat a little bit later, but they really outline what, um, what, what degeneracy is and how it contributes to movement. So just coming back to um, the foot, the foot is really functionally a structure which can reconfigure its um, its architectural structure in, re in response to dynamical requirements. So for example, the foot can fulfill the same role on multiple terrains, and it can fulfill that role by modifying its behavior, particularly its arch behavior, to meet the demands of the terrain or the task. Um, so it's a flexible structure, and the flexibility within the foot structure allows us to spread the work burden associated with large impacts and uh, the potential for subsequent tissue damage. Um, because once we went within that flexible structure, what we have are essentially movement options. So again, that variability. And because we have that variability and because we have multiple uh, structures that can collectively modify their, their behaviors, what we have is a degenerate system that is able to facilitate stress management. Because if you think about your runner who's maybe um, running a marathon, the number of contacts they might make over that marathon, three to five times body weight each contact, that is a significant amount of stress that the body has to manage. Um, so just as a side note, quite often what we see in literature um, is, particularly around foot strike, is um, people who might start as a forefoot or midfoot striker and end as a rear foot striker um, by the time they reach the end of a marathon. So if anyone's unclear, four foot strike is where you um, hit the ground with the first third of the foot or the, the um, pads underneath the toes. Um, and then that might be followed by the heel hitting the ground and midfoot is where the middle of the foot hits the ground first. And then obviously a heel strike or a rear foot strike is where the heel of the foot hits the ground first. Um, and like I said, in some of the literature, what we see particularly with fatigue is people who might start as a mid, sorry, a mid or a four foot striker, but by the time they're fatigued or they reach the end of a marathon, for example, they might be more inclined to heel strike. And, you know, my thought process is not necessarily that that's a negative um, aspect of fatigue, but is a response to fatigue to continue mitigating those forces over time. Um, but because the foot has to respond and it has to respond with essentially zero delay, so we can't have lots of neural input, it has to be something that is, is relatively quick to respond. Um, what, we, what we have within the foot is essentially lots of mechanisms for changing the, the arch structure or modifying the arch structure. Um, so increasing or decreasing the amount of um, arch movement. And this really comes from uh, the integration of or the, man the management of, um, of tissues through muscle contribution. Um, <clears throat> but again, going back to my, my previous point, what the foot does impacts, what the knee does impacts, what the hip does, et cetera. So whatever happens at the foot has to be mitigated further up the chain and vice versa. But I think for me, the, the concept of biotensegrity is a framework within the foot structure, but also within the, um, the chain is essentially a really beautiful way of describing how tensional changes within um, within the lo local foot structure and within the chain really allow us to adjust the arch of the foot, to deform, to dampen, to absorb, and to essentially mitigate or manage uh, deformations or impacts um, associated with ground contact, which I, I find really interesting as well. Um, I don't even think we've scratched the surface on what the foot is capable of. Um, I definitely don't think we, we understand enough about it in running, hence why I've come in and hope to find out a little bit more. Um, so one of the other um, things that came up, and this has come um, from, I think, previous questions in tea parties, is the role of footwear and also the role of different strike patterns. 
So I just wanted to give you some um, context about what footwear can do to, uh, or how footwear can impact foot behavior, and then also um, how different strike patterns can impact foot behavior and then more local limb behavior as well. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we have different types of strike pattern. Um, and ultimately, so far, there have been three classifications of, of strike pattern, your rear foot strike, your mid foot strike, and your fore foot strike. But within those classifications, there are also subclassifications. So it becomes very, very complex. Um, but ultimately, what you have within the foot structure is obviously this great architecture, this arch, which has a significant role in dampening forces. But then we also have things like fat pads and you have a fat pad at the heel and just underneath the, the toes and they ultimately deform. And again, they can manage impact forces. Um, but the, the fat pad underneath the heel is only subject to a, a limited amount of deformation. So the concept behind cushioning shoes is ultimately you have this great cushioning in the heel and that mitigates the need to, um, to use the, the, the heel fat pad. Now, when someone transitions to a low cushion shoe, so either a, a barefoot or a minimalist shoe, what we have is removal of that cushion. And if you were continuing to heel strike with a non-cushion shoe, it would likely become painful. And that's why there's um, lots of people who end up becoming forefoot strikers as a result of changing footwear. Um, so there's a question about cushioning. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I suppose, in, in my opinion, knowing what the foot is capable of, um, I think, you know, we want to use the foot to our full advantage. And, and part of that is ultimately um, making use of the plantar heel, uh, the plantar fat pad, sorry, which are, which are much better at managing for. So do I think we should remove cushioning from everyone's shoes? Probably not because you've got a lot of people who are habituated to cushioning shoes uh, or cushioned shoes, should I say, so it would take a, a longer transition period. But nonetheless, what we have are these fantastic heel pads who, uh, sorry, these uh, fantastic fat pads that are capable of deforming load and they contribute to um, the tensional requirements of the foot as well. It also is a really sensory rich environment. So we gain a lot of information from the base of the foot, which is uh, often muddied by um, uh, by heavily cushioned shoes because again you're not getting that feedback around your environment you're not getting that feedback around the type of ground you're contacting um within uh, your traditional running shoes or or uh, trainers we see a narrowed toe box um where versus in sort of barefoot slash minimalist shoes a lot of those shows uh, shoes will have a wider toe box um, and from a um, perspective of what that does to um, foot function, well, a lot of the uh, rationale for formation of things like hallus valgus or bunions is related to habitual use of narrow toe boxes, um, which essentially just squashes that big toe. Um, and then we lose the ability to uh, make use of those, those key flexor muscles but then the other thing is with a lot of traditional footwear, and I suppose this is the most important thing to us from um, a tissue perspective, is a lot of shoes come with some form of arch support, whether they're a neutral shoe, there's probably still some, um, some minor arch support, with, uh, support within the shoe. And what that does is essentially um, we, we see weakness uh, within the plantar intrinsic foot muscles. And there's four layers of these muscles within the foot and they essentially contribute to either tensioning or um, dissipation of the art structure. So they're really integral into managing or mitigating foot behavior. Um, and with, with a lack of um, function within the plantar intrinsic foot muscles, we also see a decrease in hallux function, so big toe function. And again, we lose that ability to um, steer or direct force via the big toe, we lose that stability within the big toe as well. So ultimately there's a strong argument for moving into um, minimalist footwear and I think again from my, my perspective uh, and I apologise for being opinionated but it's quite it's a topic that um, I'm becoming quite passionate about. I think you know if we, if we want to um, exploit 
the the foot and the, the great function it has then really we want to be moving and, and practicing in barefoot slash minimal, minimalist shoes as much as possible do i believe that it's the right choice for everyone and um, no because and um, like the discussion we had in the um tea party on athletic performance if you have someone who is sat for eight hours a day and then they run for an hour we're not going to mitigate other risks associated with for example glutes that aren't doing their their function which is a whole uh, different discussion for us to have i think and um, the other question that i think uh, came up was is there a preferred strike pattern then um and the foot is essentially there's a lot of literature that suggests our um uh i suppose the most optimal optimal strike pattern for us is a four foot strike pattern because the um the metatarsal fat pad is essentially much greater at managing high impacts the foot is uh, appropriately tensioned to again mitigate those forces we uh, potentially make better use of some of the key muscles like the gastrocnemius um but i think that has to come from um essentially if someone has poor movement quality, like going back to the example of someone who's been sat, you know, seated for eight hours a day and we're potentially seeing issues with, uh, with um, hip function or muscles around the, around the hip and pelvis, then I think one of the, the key things for me is do we necessarily need to go ahead and try and change their strike pattern? I would suggest not um, because ultimately there's other things that we can focus on as practitioners. But let's first of all consider what drives strike pattern um in in running coaching a lot of people will try and primarily change strike pattern because four foot striking is seen to be more efficient however i suppose again um my opinion on the subject is the foot has a specific role in terms of what it does when it's in contact with the ground and how it contributes to management of impact forces but ultimately the hip sets the foot position so to give you an example, um, for anyone who, who runs, you might, you might recognize the term overstride. Um, and overstride comes when someone lands with a very distinctive heel strike pattern and the foot lands out in front of their body. Um, and that is associated with a high number of um, risks or injury risks. However, if I change the positioning of my hip um, and I land so that the foot is more directly below my body it's very difficult to heel strike in that pattern um, equally what happens is the the foot goes behind the body is dictated by what my hip does and how um, how much extension i have so ultimately the, the foot is almost a slave to the hip drive pattern but what the foot does when it's on the floor is really important um, and I think we often just consider the foot to be a base of support, but actually when it hits the ground, it's a modulator because the first thing the foot does is respond to the ground contact, but it also is an informer. It sends information back to or back up the central nervous system chain to inform us about sensation, to inform us about um, environmental cueing. So I see the foot has a substantial role that exceeds it being just a base of support, for example. Um, and as I said, it modulates and mitigates behaviours and it informs us of um, our local environment. Um, and I see that behaviour as being quite modular. So we have what happens at the foot, what happens at the knee, what happens at the, um, at the pelvis and so on. Of course, it's all related. And again, kind of coming back to this ne nearly decomposable system, they all have independent roles, but they're functionally integrated as well. And that always makes me think of the song, The Ankle Connects to the Knee Bone. Uh, so that's where that comes from. Um, but uh, like I said, the, the role of the foot in terms of how it manages and mitigates those impact forces is really based on the tissue quality of the foot, the um, the uh, capabilities and strength of the plantar intrinsic foot muscles to uh, to manage things like arch modulation or arch behavior and then the connection with uh, with higher tissues as well and one of the things that i'm reading a, a little bit more about at the moment is uh, pronation behavior um, and i am of the mindset that excessive pronation where we have 
excessive flattening of the arch throughout um, throughout the rain gait cycle is essentially more of a risk or is more damage control than an actual risk factor for injury. Um, and essentially, you know, my, my thoughts and opinions on, on that are the um, management of the arch is substantial to, as I said, mitigating and managing impact forces. And quite frankly, I think what happens is when we have runners who significantly overstride or step too far out in front of the body, they um, we quite often see excessive pronation or, or flattening of the arch. And I'm of the opinion that ha that, that happens to manage what the um, heel heel pad can no longer manage um, because you have quite a significant amount of force when your um, heel lands way out in front of you. Um, so a few other things that um, I think are substantial to our understanding of the foot and the interaction with um, other joints within the series and then our understanding of biotensegrity in, in running is I think the one thing that we need to move away from is this idea that force is bad because I don't I don't think um, impact force or, or ground reaction forces are necessarily responsible for injury risk but I think how we interact with those forces and then the, the subsequent interaction with other risk factors like fatigue or, or prior injury are and I think um, you know my, my thinking as a practitioner and I don't know about some of the other practitioners in the um, uh, in the chat, but we need to learn to love force and we need to make use of it because, yes, force force can be dangerous, but we also like force because it gives us energy um, and it gives us essentially free energy where we don't have to use the heavy cost of our um, uh, muscles. And I think that needs to be apparent in our treatment modality. So more of the things that I'm doing now in terms of um, working around foot behavior and foot function is rather than doing lots of passive treatments where I might do soft tissue work with someone lying and not loading, I'm actually doing a lot more with people in standing. I'm doing a lot more loading work um, with them. And when I say loading, I mean, you know, they're, they're in a standing position um, because I think what we need to do if we're going to try and mod modify the behavior of tissues is do that in a manner which reflects the, the you know the activity or, or the functional requirements of the tasks we're asking them to do um, and the other thing that I think comes uh, uh, we need to consider as well is if you read any of the literature around uh, foot function slash um, injury risks that are maybe apparent because of foot function so excessive pronation for example um, as I said I actually think that the foot is almost a slave to the hip drive the foot lands where the hip places it. Um, and this was something that was really brought to my attention by a practitioner called Shane Benzi. He's ha actually written a book that I would highly recommend reading called The, the Lost Art of Running. And I know he just touched on um, biotensegrity within that, uh, within that book as well. But, you know, he said to me, um, Jen, you know, your, your hip is going to place the foot. The foot doesn't place the foot. The hip drives where the foot lands. But what your foot does when it is in contact with the ground is important. And um, so I think this sort of brings me back to differences between working open chain and closed chain. I think we we as practitioners, if we're going to collectively modify the tissues, uh, sorry, the behavior of tissues, need to address it in positions that reflect function as opposed to, you know, may, maybe where we've come from in the past, which is doing lots of nice passive soft tissue work. Um, and I'm sure Graham might have have some thoughts on that, uh, as does Neil. Um, but certainly it's something that I've been integrating into my practice and seeing uh, good outcomes from as well. So I hope that has been an interesting talk. I appreciate it. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour into um, into running behaviour and foot behaviour. But I would, I would love to have questions. So let me just stop sharing for us now. Thank you, Jen. Can, I, can I ask a question before anyone else rushes in? Yeah. You're talking about the foot, largely about a lot about running, mm -hmm. and presumably the same principles apply with walking. Yeah. Uh, just everyday walking and distance walking as well. So shoes are very important there as well, which shoe manufacturers may not be overly enthusiastic about hearing all this. That, uh, yeah. that uh, it's going to be relevant. Yeah. And do you know, Graham, I actually find, I mean, if I'm being honest, I think I haven't done a huge amount of 
work or as much work on on walking gait and there are lots of similarities um but i actually think you know from from a, a practitioner perspective the best place to start is someone's walking pattern because i think you get a good indication of how well the hip is stabilizing and what um what that foot behavior might look like and actually you you more than personally i think you're more than likely to see um excessive pronation or um greater issues within uh, with uh, with foot behavior in walking gait because it's slower there's more time or more requirement for the foot to to manage force um in my opinion even though the force is uh, lower you might yeah. see some more interesting stuff in walking gait oh, thank you thank you i very much enjoyed your I, I'm sorry, I very much enjoyed your presentation and um, I am <clears throat> I'm delighted on the one hand that you obviously have such a wonderful respect for feet. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time that you're respectful of feet, I'm upset at the language that we use, mm. you know, the, the the decomposable, you know, to cause to rot or putrefy, uh, seems like something that we don't need to use in order yeah. to have this conversation. And the same is also true of degeneracy. Uh, in your paper, you relate, you, you, you do reference Simon in his article in 1962 about the architecture of complexity. And we have some, some wonderful new books, including The Systems View of Life by Capra and Luisi, which I put up in the chat. That was published just a few years ago and, and does not include any mention at all of either of those terms, because within a biological setting, uh, although they have persisted with some authors, they're redundant now, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I think we, I mean, um, we had a, obviously, discussion about terminology before um, before everyone joined the chat. And I think this is one of the, the key issues around complexity in itself. I mean, if you read anything about complexity, there's so many different, um, opinions isn't the right word, but approaches to the theory of complexity that really muddied the water. And I suppose at the time of writing, where I was in terms of my understanding of complexity was via the early work of um, Simon. You know, since, uh, since I suppose f the further into the, um, the thesis I've got, I've accessed other sources and I agree a lot of other sources don't even touch upon the early work of Simon. And um, I, I think the idea of the relationship being weak but not negligible isn't um it doesn't necessarily apply to biological systems because i actually think weak but not negligible doesn't uh doesn't fulfill the idea of of movement function does it because those relationships aren't weak those relationships are um well they're, they're powerful aren't they they're, they're substantial um so Again, if I go back to the paper, would I include it now? Probably not. Um, but then equally, I, you know, I think from a complexity standpoint, I also am only I'm only scratching the surf surface of what I understand about um, about complexity. And I think from uh, a biological standpoint, we're only just really introducing complexity into more mainstream um, mainstream texts. It's still it's still not. Uh, not featured in a number of a number of mainstream texts or uh, in mainstream books, should I say? That's right. And as the systems people try to embrace biotensegrity, I think the biotensegrity people need to be using biotensegrity language mm -hmm. in order to describe the hierarchical, the the relationship, the the unity, the integration. We have wonderful words that are not rejecting and upsetting and distracting uh, yeah. that, that would still allow us access to all of the wealth of these concepts. Yeah. I mean, you know, you think about the language we use in 
um, in rehabilitation, generally our, our, a lot of our language needs revising. The amount of times I hear someone who's been told they have weak glutes or or weak, uh, I don't know, weak hamstrings, and you think, well, that it's a dangerous term, isn't it? It's a really dangerous term to use with patients, but I think it's the same from an academic or professional development perspective as well. The terminology that's used can be very damaging in terms of people's understanding of um, of of concepts. And I kind of give you another example. We in strength and conditioning, we talk a lot about stiffness, but if you go onto Google and, and search joint stiffness, it has positive connotations and negative connotations in athletic performance. So for example, um, we might talk about joint stiffness being um, management of, of tissue tension, which affords us better, uh, better use of our um, elasticity versus joint stiffness, which is poor joint movement. So, so we all, all you know, there's, a number of terms that I think generally we need revising within within the athletic slash rehabilitation industry generally. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand, uh, Neil. I think, like I said, ha, would, would I use that terminology if I rewrote the paper now? Possibly not. Um, but I think that's come with my understanding of complexity um, has developed since then as well. I, the other Neil, thing can I jump in here? Yes, of course. You said we have wonderful words and you're talking about the biotensegrity paradigm. And I know that everybody listening to this would love to hear you s say those words and summarize them for us. Oh dear Lord, <laughs> uh, that's not as easy. Uh, you know, I think what we have to do is we have to go back to Steve's writings about this. Uh, uh, Dr. Levin has given this a great deal of thought over many years and has chosen his words and rechosen his words. And, and I think uh, we need to try to stick to the vocabulary as, as best we can. Uh, but I was, I was hoping to lead the conversation in a slightly different direction because also in the 1960s, Alistair Hardy and uh, Morgan discussed the aquatic ape hypothesis, that, that some of our evolutionary past was at the water's edge and in and around the water. And I'd like to think about uh, what you have to say as, about the foot as, a, as a, an ideal tool for swimming. That's a tricky question, Neil. Is it an ideal tool for swimming? Hmm. Can well, I leave well, this well, with me? If yes, it's okay, well, I'm gonna have to think well, about well, it. While you think about this for a moment, at an earlier uh, tea party, we discussed some aspects of the anatomy of the horse. Mm. And of course the horse has, runs on two, two toes at the front. I'm sorry, two, two fingers at the front and two toes at the back. and and the horse may be an even better runner than the human. Uh, we need a broad-based, wide, flat foot so that uh, our swimmers can swim. And, and the, the dimensions of our evolutionary development, although walking and running is super important, I think we have to broaden our lens a little and think what are all the wonderful things that we ask of for our feet? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think we we don't we have we do not understand that much about the foot. We think I think there's a lot of um, authors that would argue we do, but I mean, from my perspective, you read biomechanics literature, for example, and the foot is just it's a lump, it's a base of support that sits at the end of the leg, and it does a, a couple of key jobs, and that's it. But I mean, you know, I've spent the last few years just trying to pick apart um, the different aspects of foot function. And I, I can say hand on heart that you read one paper and then you write, you read another paper and what you thought you understood about foot function here is just disrupted by what you've read in another paper. And that is even muddied by our, our, our current thoughts on um, 
for dysfunction, uh, for want of a, a better word, because there's been so much focus on pronation being a problem, when the reality is pronation is an integral part of foot function. Um, but I think we've, we've lost sight of ha- how much the foot contributes to, uh, to function. But again, a lot of our literature has been around walking and running. There's been very, very little literature around other, um, other primary movements. There's, no, there's hardly any literature, to, to my knowledge, within jumping activity, other than, again, your, your foot is a base of support. It fulfills a job as a base of support. So do you think there needs to be some breadth? But, you know, like I said to you earlier, I just we haven't even scratched the surface on, on foot behaviour. Um, yes. there's, there's been really great uh, growth in the last few years, particularly as we've seen um, some interest in development of plantar intrinsic foot muscles. So there was a great paper about 2015, the foot core um, system, and that really started bringing people's attention to um, to the plantar intrinsic foot muscles. There was a sort of few papers uh, preceding this, um, but really uh, the paper by McKeon's the uh, I suppose the one that has again just led the way in terms of um, development in our understanding of plantar intrinsic foot muscles. But again, e- even even our anatomical understanding of those those behaviours is is still fairly limited compared to um other proximal joints like the uh, the hip and the shoulder for example so it w- it would be i think moving forward interesting to see how the growth of research within foot behavior in um in other activities develops but at the moment it's predominantly around walking and running gait have you had any opportunity to work around uh oriental methods of exercise including tai chi and so forth. I have a I have a a sense as I look at these other alternative ways of exercising mm. that uh, in some parts of the world we are so much more kind and gentle and soft with our feet, and mm. in other parts, particularly in North America, we seem to be particularly hard and unkind and nasty uh, to our feet, and I. I have a sense that we get what we deserve a little bit when it comes to injury. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, this comes back to, this comes back to, I think, opinions about feet. It always surprises me when you uh, talk to people and this might just be because I'm fascinated by it, but you talk to people about feet or I've been on courses before where, um, you know we've gone to work on feet and you always get someone who's like oh no I don't oh, I don't want to touch feet oh. and I think this is just this association with it being you know it's, it's low down on the priority list it's shoved in a shoe no we don't we don't really need to worry about that and certainly from you know from my perspective I've just seen a question come up uh, a little bit earlier about what I actually do <laughs> so I obviously lecture in the university but I work practically with uh, with people as well so I'm a strength and conditioning coach and a a therapist and I think people's opinion as I said of the foot is it just goes in a shoe and that's it and you you know you hit the ground over and over again with your foot doesn't really matter but ultimately like you know foot care and management of the tissues in the in the foot can have a really substantial effect on on people's movement quality but again it comes back to some of our movement habits as well. I'm sat in a chair now. We spend however many hours a day sat in a chair because we're, you know, we're, we're working or we're, we're doing whatever our lifestyle dictates. And I, I generally think we don't take as much care of our bodies or our slash our movement quality um, as we could be. So I know Chris is uh, using a standing desk at the minute or likes to stand you know, there's so much research coming out now about the um, the benefits of, of standing. Again, I think it, for me, it comes back to this idea of loading the body. We like load. We, we like being subject to, uh, to gravitational force. Um, so, you know, I'll give you, give you a personal example. Um, when I started on my sort of journey of, uh, you know, working with, uh, with foot function, I bought myself some toe spreaders uh, because I realised that my my toes were starting to get squashed from wearing um, wearing narrow toe boxes, and I would wear the toe spreaders for an hour a day, and then it went up and up and up and up, and I wasn't really noticing that much change in my toe behaviour. 
And then I started doing it in standing positions. I started using them um, in exercise positions. And actually the response was much greater. I was getting, um, you know, I was getting a greater outcome from wearing the toe spreaders. My toe function improved. So the ability to move my big toe independently improved. And I think this kind of goes back to my, my point. We, we generally don't take care of our bodies because of a lot of, um, a lot of habits. We don't take care of our feet because it's just seen as, it does a little bit of a job at the end of the leg, but the legs the most important, or, you know, joints within the higher region of the leg are more important. Um, and I just think it gets dismissed. It gets definitely gets dismissed in athletic conditioning. But I am here to change that. I'm just going to point out, I am, I am going to be the one that changes this. <laughs> Could I ask you a little about variation, the personal mm -hmm. variation in terms of uh, feet and leg length and proportion uh, and how common that is and how it impacts exercise in terms of um things like limb length discrepancy yes um i have to say uh, practically i very rarely come across um so uh, if i if i work with people who have limb length discrepancies quite often they're functional um and the relationship I tend to see in people is um, we might have one where there's, um, again, flattening of the arch on one foot and the potential for more of a supinated or high arch on the other foot. Again, similar to, to the discussion about running, um, a lot of that for me is... Um, do, so if I'm working with someone who has a functional limb length discrepancy, I will try and modify hip uh, behaviour before I try and modify um, foot behaviour for the reason that a lot of the issues I see with functional um, limb length discrepancy is related to habitual patterns. Um, so, for example, someone who might weight shift onto one leg um, habitually and then I, you, you end up seeing this sort of functional shortening or lengthening of one limb. And what happens with functional shortening of one limb? I mean, if anyone wants to join in this practically, that would be great. If you stand up and shift your weight to one side, the feet follow, the arches of the, the feet respond. Um, and that tends to be more of what I see, to be honest, Neil. Um, I see it in, in people who've had prior injury and they've maybe habituated uh, to weight bearing more on one side. So personally, I don't try and moderate or modify foot behaviours directly. I'll, I'll often work on... Um, trying to modify their habitual stance patterns um, and that might be through you know essentially um, working on things like single limb stability or single limb stance um, or it might be on other you know other forms of strength training like lunge patterns and things like that. Let me ask you to look to the chat and see if any of these questions uh, are particularly attractive. Just can I for a moment guys come in there that uh we're at the hour now, so perhaps invite everyone to um, turn on their videos and uh, while we're doing the look at the questions. I think Rachel was checking out the question, is that right? Yes, thank you, Graham. We have quite a few questions. Um, Starting with um, Smar, which uh, I don't know if she wants to come on and ask her own question or um, I can do that. It was about um, further clarification of decomposable systems. Was, was that answered in the presentation or would you like me to go back? I know we've had quite a lengthy discussion on that since, so I don't, I don't want to go uh, repeat or already what we've, what we've said. I don't know, Su uh, Summer, can you let me know if it was answered? She posted it during the presentation. Um, are you there anywhere, Summer? Yeah, Summer says yes, I think so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Chris actually had the next one, um, and that relates also to one that Carol asked in terms of asking you, Jen, to speak about um, plantar fasciitis, the causes of plantar fasciitis and treatments for 
um, for plantar fasciitis? Yeah, so I know um, there's also another comment further down. So I'm just scrolling through. So I just wanted to pick up on them both. Um, I know Carol's mentioned she'd also like to know about plantar fasciitis coming from restrictions higher up in the thorax and pelvis. Um, and I suppose, again, kind of going, this sort of comes back to a previous discussion around, um, for me, the, the foot is a bit of a slave to uh, to the position of the, the body and ultimately the hip drives what the foot does. So I do think um, certainly whatever is happening around the thorax and pelvis can impact the position of the foot and the demands on the foot. So Carol, I think there's, you know, there's a really strong argument for the development of overuse injuries local to the foot that are potentially just due, due to um, issues that stem from, from higher up. Because as I said, what the foot does is try to manage and mitigate force. And if those forces are high because there is an issue with positioning higher up that chain, um, so, sorry, a cat just jumped on my lap, um, then ultimately... Um, yeah, I think that the foot has to try and manage those forces and that's where it's subject to um, to overuse. Uh, going back to the um, question about uh, plantar fasciitis, Chris, you know, for me, plantar fasciitis is real um, a real good example of an overuse injury and it, it perhaps occurs because um, that, that foot is having to work hard to manage or mitigate forces that it's it's generally not um, conditioned to manage. Hence why it becomes more apparent in people who start to increase their mileage too quickly. We obviously see it a lot in um, people who gain weight uh, quickly over a period of time. So for example, um, with pregnancy. And generally I think it's because one, there's a may maybe a change in, in loading pattern or two, the tissues aren't necessarily conditioned to, to manage or mitigate those impact forces. Um, so from my perspective, I think, you know, in terms of early, early acute management, then yes, soft tissue, soft tissue tri uh, treatment, should I say, um, is, is useful, but I'd be more inclined to assess foot function and then um, arch behavior as well. Um, and then to try and moderate arch behavior or, or to uh, uh, strengthen arch behavior um, by a foot, foot localized foot exercises, so plantar in, intrinsic foot muscle exercises, um, but then also assessing higher up the chain as well to ensure that the reason the foot is um, potentially working so hard isn't related to something a bit higher up. Thanks, Jen. Any more questions? Well, we have. Um, I have a question. Okay, great. Hi, Wilbur. Hi, hi guys. Um, hi, Jen. How you doing? Good, good. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's very enlightening. Um, well, a couple of things that I think uh, I want to mention um, uh, based on, I, I came in about 10 minutes late and I'm sorry. Uh, if you've discussed it before, then that's fine. Um, but uh, you said a couple of things which are interested, and uh, one of them is uh, you talked about the cushioning fact about shoes acting as a cushion. Sorry, we're and, um, can you, just you can't hear me? Yeah, can I said that. I, sorry, let me see if my uh, speaker here is working properly. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, we said that uh, the foot is a cushion, and yeah, that's a very contentious because a lot of shoe designers, um, Nike, Adidas, whatever, are making shoes with cushion. And at one time, I know Nike used to make a shoe with air in it to say that you're having better cushion is going to be able to absorb shock. Well, the, the most efficient shock absorbing system we know is our body that's designed for the way our body is designed. And if we really go back and we look at the biotin segral architecture of our foot and the structures above the foot, we will see that the, the, the design is, is one of the most efficient way for shock absorbing. And shoes really don't actually act as very good shock absorbers for a system, especially if we're doing a high speed or slow speed running or fast walking. 
for the simple reason I think is that uh, there's a, a guy in Montreal, uh, Pierre Lagasse, who did some research actually way back in the, I think in the, in the 80s or late 70s, which show that, you know, when you add cushion to shoes and you make the sole of the shoes thicker, like, you know, these new shoes, they have these uh, rockers and all of these, whatever the names they call them, it actually makes the foot more unstable, number one which creates a huge problem in terms of, of general dynamic stability in the foot. And one of my, one of my, uh, and that's a, that's a very interesting because he's, he was able to show that the center of gravity changes so your center of mass. And, uh, and that creates a whole bunch of instability in terms of how the hip controls what's going on in the foot. And the other thing is that from a strictly uh, biological concept, I think if, if the creator or whoever made the body wanted to have more cushion in the feet, I think they would put, I always tell my, my classes when I teach running, they would put, they would put air in, uh, they would put the lungs on the feet because uh, <laughs> more cushioning does not, af does not afford you any more sort of shock absorbing in, in your system. Your body is designed for shock absorbing. And shoes for me are basically as coffins, as you mentioned in your talk. Shoes are like me, coffins for the foot. Shoes will kill your foot in terms of deactivation of your sensory capacity, deactivation of your myofascial tissue capacity in terms of taking load. And that's what shoes do. They, they make your foot much weaker, especially if they cause restriction in terms of movement. Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Levin, in one of his lectures, he has a beautiful uh, uh, example he uses with a bridge and the way that the foot is designed and the foot is designed to be able to take forces in all sorts of in omnidirectional forces in the way that it has the capacity to adapt to forces from all different type of direction and i think for me when i look at at we talk about neil asked the question about how why the foot is broad and for swimmers and stuff like that. The reason I think the foot has 26 bones, some 19 muscles and some 33 ligaments is to give you the ability to adapt to walk over terrain, uneven terrain. We won't design to walk on flat land like we do or walk on, on paved floors and on paved streets or run on paved street. We're designed to walk in a forest where we have to lift our feet over obstacles. We have to step on pebbles and stone. So the foot is designed in that way to give a multifunctional and adaptability to taking forces from all sorts of direction. And that's why I think we have all these small bones in there. You look at animals who don't have those bones in and they don't necessarily are designed to take the same terrain that we do right? They're not necessarily designed for that. And, uh, and <clears throat> for me, anytime the foot is put into a position where it cannot absorb its load, like in terms of, of plantar fasciitis, torsional stress is introduced, which is an overload, obviously, and the hip and the upper and the thoracic can contribute to that because where biotensegrity works is upside down, downside up, if the forces are, are, are uneven in the, in the distribution, it creates torsional stress. And most patients, when you go and you look at the usually tearing and, 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 and that's an evidence of torsional stress. That's one, that's one example of what happens. And we see it in people with rigid foot too, people who have very rigid foot, pest carver's foot. They also have a lot of plantar fascia problems, even if they're not runners. And that's again, because of abnormal force distribution in terms of loading. So th there's a lot of different uh, capacity in terms of, not capacity, but ways of terms of looking at these different conditions from a functional aspect. And it raises, like you, I'm very excited about feet. <laughs> That's what I do. I do. And, um, and yes, the foot is not independent in its behavior. It depends on the whole system and the way it's set up. Even the arm, the way you move your arm is the way you set your foot down, not just the hip. So when we teach in running, the arm and the breathing pattern affects how your foot hits the ground. And, and 
this is uh, this goes for a longer discussion in terms of running but if you're teaching if you talk about the people coaches and the way they for they learn from experiential um behaviors the the the, the, the foot behavior is not just governed by the, by the foot itself mm -hmm. so we have to, we have to think about that and we have to think about something I, obviously i don't know if you mentioned it before but a lot of this the injuries are not just from the the, the, the the magnitude of the load, but it's the duration of loading. Mm. The duration of loading is very important because in a pest cabas foot, what you find is that the duration of loading is different than in a foot that's what we consider to be a flat foot. And injury rate increases because of the duration of loading, not necessarily because of the magnitude of the load. It's the duration. The rate of loading, in other words, how how much of the load is occurring at in a certain amount of time, and that's just the way connective tissue behaves. Yeah, you know? that's just how connective tissue responds to load. It's not so much about the magnitude that's important, but it's the it's the rate of loading that's what affects connective tissue. So, oh, thanks, Wilbur. I think somebody else had their hand up. Carol, Carol Davis, did you have your hand up? I wanted to get into a discussion about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> and um, both both are equally important. And um, there's been an emphasis, of course, Jennifer, with your work about um, changing movement patterns to mitigate pain, and of course that's very very important. But finding and, re and releasing collagen pulls and fascial restrictions that are undoing alignment, to me would probably better become coming first so that when then when the person's aligned we can work on the movement patterns and that they'll especially if you if you're if you have sustained um, pressure and elongation to the fascia and melting the tissue i know that's controversial but if we can soften the tissue and get the tissue to align better, get the pelvis even so that the, there's not one anterior rotation, so there's a leg length discrepancy, get the upslip uh, taken care of of the pelvis, and then take a look at what's happening to the legs and the feet and start working below hamstrings, gastroxoleus, and work on the feet, and then start working on gait and start working on movement patterns along with the alignment so that when the person learns the new movement pattern, they're not automatically, the collagen isn't pulling them back out of alignment and getting them back into the movement pattern so that they, they have to think about every step in order to be able to make the correction. And that's, yeah, that's I, my own opinion. I, I, and yeah, I, I think it's a really valid, valid point. And, and I suppose it does come back to this chicken and egg. I suppose I suppose my only, only, only counter argument to that would be a lot of our behavior is dictated, sorry, a lot of our behavior dictates, let's just say again, for want of a better word, changes within the tissue architecture. So the problem becomes then how do we detect which has come first or which is which is um, facilitating the other? What I do think that the point you've raised is really important because what we do by doing soft tissue work, and I still practice soft tissue work as well, is we create a window of opportunity um, and, you know, I'm of the I'm of the belief that if you don't uh, address the behavior, then you're not going to see a uh, long term change in someone. Right. How you address that behavior um, in the initial stages, particularly if you have pain, might not necessarily be in the gross functional activities. We want them to do in activities of daily living. However, you should be doing something that facilitates change within or neuro uh, neuro changes because ultimately what you're trying to do is break a, um, a habit. And if I'm being pattern, most, right. mm -hmm. most the, the majority of injuries I see are, you know, a, a, a overuse injuries that come from poor movement quality or lowered movement quality. So essentially, you know, what we, what we do in soft tissue work or what we do in manual work is we create this nice window of opportunity, but a lot of it occurs passively. So we make these passive changes but then we need to do something that also reinforces right. good movement or good patterning. So I think the two go hand in hand for definite. Um, right. You know, and I think I think the changes we can make as as therapists, as as um, people who do any form of manual therapy, 
are really fantastic but one of my issues is a lot of the time we have um you know uh, sports massage therapists or we have therapists who do an hour's worth of soft tissue work and then that person goes off and they just keep doing the same movement habits or the same they have the same movements habits they had before and they're coming back to us and I suppose you know the, the really nice thing about being involved in this um uh, in this group is we're here to shake things up because I think ultimately what we're doing for our uh, recreational athletes at the moment isn't good enough. So take running, for example, you know, uh, and again, this kind of goes back to Wilbur's point about, uh, about footwear and the promises that footwear can make. We have um, 60 to 80% of our runners, people doing the park runs and whatever, getting injuries per year that figure hasn't changed for a long time yet we have all these fantastic tools and different types of footwear and you know all these promises of decreasing injury risk in people because we know about pronation and we can give people fancy foam rolling exercises to do those injury risks aren't changing quite frankly I think we do need to shake things up because at the minute it's not good enough we're we're really um doing our our movers and shakers a bit of a disservice at the minute um and i think you know we the night like i said the nice thing about being in this group is we are here to shake it up and we are here to challenge the current current state of the um manual therapy industry and the movement uh, movement industry i'm all here for it as well i'm here for it i'd like to comment on that uh something that we miss um in uh, a a person who approaches us for pain uh, for some dysfunction is systematic whole body of mo- whole body movement. And this is a program that is so important to get tune up all the fascia globally so that it is responsive to change. Um, and we this is so often missed because as you say, you do your you do your massage or whatever and then you walk away and there's no integration. If you don't do movement after you have massage, then you you lose the the change. The brain doesn't got, get the information that a change has occurred, and now it needs to be integrated. Uh, so systematic variety of whole body movement is really important. That's what I use Bartenia Fundamentals for, and I think we always have to be looking at the whole. Running is a whole body movement. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt here quickly. Hold on, uh, just one second, Dr. Levin, because uh, we have we're tracking the order of the questions, and uh, please let us unmute you when you are ready to talk. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Levin. Sorry for that. Uh, I, I just want to get to a very basic point of what the foot does. Uh, I, you know, again, away from the treatment kinds of thing. What we're doing with the foot is the foot is a point of contact with a compression force. And the foot then changes that compression force into a tensional force that is then distributed through the body. And that's probably I'm a major function of the foot because all the forces that enter into the bones are, compress- are tensional forces that then convert to compression in the bone. But the foot takes the compressional force and converts it to a tensional force. And you see that in the two little sesamoids under the head of the first metatarsal, which are little soft little bones that if they really compressed up against the first metatarsal, you would be like uh, hitting hitting it with an anvil and crushing these very soft bones, which are like a peanut shell. Uh, They're no harder than a peanut shell. And what it does is immediately changes it into a tensional force that then goes through the body and and distributes through the whole body. So the real forces come from there. And I think that's a fundamental concept you already have to pick up. The other thing is that in order for the foot to function properly, it should hit the ground normally at right angles to the ground and take the forces at right angles to the ground so it does not have any shear under it and because shear is destroys all the tissues and every, everything else. Shear is the enemy. Uh, 
Thank you, Steve. Any response to that? Or we have some more questions? I have a, oh, any more questions? I have Wait. a response to Steve. Uh, Comment. Yeah, I think go ahead. We had some questions that weren't necessarily specifically to panel members. It was in the chat around breathing and languaging, um, potentially for other tea parties. If anyone wants to speak to that, I'm sure they can, but I would say go ahead here, Wilbur. All right. So, uh, yeah, in, in reference to what Dr. Levin talked about, uh, we, we just had a discussion about that this week, uh, he and myself. And this is very important what he says about assessing my bones, because it comes back to the point that I mentioned before, which is about the rate of loading. There's just absolutely no way if the, if the contact point is so long, it has to be very brief. And that's the only thing I'd add to what Dr. Levin says is a brief contact. This is, what's, this is the key function. And this is the key function in why technique for running is so important. And, uh, and this brief contact, allowing the tensional forces to become compressive is a key. And if, the, if that contact point is lengthened, which happens in terms of poor technique, or in terms of pronation, or excessive pronation, which longs out because there's a time the foot collapses, the subtalar joint torsions and all of this stuff, that's more, more loading time. And the, the, that rate of loading is what actually is a key factor in terms of leading leading to injuries you know um the the, the thing is about 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 the, the technique in terms of of movement is that walking and running are very similar things you know but it's just the rate at which we do things is how much time do we spend in the air that's the difference between walking and running is that in running you, you spend more time in the air you want to spend and travel maximum amount of time because you don't want to be hitting the ground too often. And that's, there's a whole different of, um, school of thought that people say, well, high frequency, if we hit the ground really quickly, means that you're running fast, which is, which is actually, I don't like to say, it's not true at all because running is not like a wheel, right? If my car wheel is spinning fast, it means that I'm going faster. But if I'm behaving where I'm increasing my frequency, but my center of mass is not moving, is not allowing me to hop, then I'm not going anywhere. So increasing frequency doesn't necessarily increase running speed. It's actually very efficient because you're spending more time on the ground, which is exposing you to more impact loading, which is exposing you to more fatigue. And when we treat running, teach running is that we want to get maximum travel distance with every time there is impact and there's a technique to do that and that's how we train runners and 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 if you look at one of the best runners in the world he takes 40 39 point something steps to get to 100 meters whereas his opponents are taking you know 42 43 steps it means that he's spending more time in the air getting more travel horizontal result on travel time out of every impact. And this is the whole concept in terms of teaching running technique. And I just wrote something on, on, on that in, in a book in terms of how is it that we can increase our efficiency in running and even walking. It's the same concept with walking. Most people just walk with chip, chip, chip. They're not lifting their, their, their foot. They're not using their hips to help them, you know, change the center of mass so that they can move forward. They're just dragging their feet along. And that again is inefficient. We are made to lift and move, right? So we don't stumble over things because when you're designed to walk in a forest, if you chip along, you're gonna stumble on things. You're gonna hit things with your toes and stuff like that. We're not designed for that as a biped. So there's a lot of things that we have to look at in terms of rational, in terms of our architectural design and how we how can we use that efficiently to propel us forward, because that's where we want to go, is forward. Thank you, Wilbur. Anybody else got anything to uh, contribute? Steve, Steve uh, Yeah, uh, just a follow up to Steve Levin's point about uh, the normal alignment of the foot 
is my favorite fitness activity is running barefoot or in minimal shoes on a grassy hillside. And so I think about foot strike a lot. And the way I understand it, the whole structure of the foot with the many bones and ligaments is to allow the foot to conform to the uneven surface so that uh, the alignment normalizes the forces. That is the forces directly through the, the foot and through the lower leg and so on. Um, I when I was younger, I had the pleasure of knowing Margaret Mead. And Margaret one time talked about how when she was in the South Pacific, she was very impressed with the island peoples who never wore shoes and how their feet when walking across streams and in the fields were so flexible that the foot could literally grab around uneven stones in order to maintain their balance and alignment. Do you mind if I just um, jump in here? Um, I think that's a really, really nice um, point, Stephen. And I think, again, this kind of goes back to um, one of the points I made earlier. We, we, if you if you look at any of the literature concerning um, uh, running injury, a lot a lot of the literature talks about the, the foot being a uh, contributor to injury risk because of pronation or excessive pronation, or you know there's a, there's a, like a lot of um, a, a lot of different um, injury risks associated with the foot. But again, going back to that point, you know. The, the foot has to fulfill a function and I think how the foot is placed on the ground is going to dictate whether it can optimally uh, fulfill its function or it can't and if it's not placed in a position that is optimal i.e it's landing way out in front of you I think its behavior has to be moderated to mitigate those potential impact forces so how the foot lands is really important and how the foot lands is going to predispose how well it it functions or whether it meets its its optimal function um, for definite. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Thank you. And for most of us as therapists, we we start we try to improve the function of the foot, but we're starting with feet, as Steve says, that uh, perhaps in a poor state compared to those uh, people in the Pacific. So we have a lot of, lot to think about. Yeah, can I chime in? Hi. Hi Susan. Imagine if your hand, you woke up every day and you put your hands inside of boxes. And then all day, whatever you did with your hands, you did with this box. And then at the end of the day, you take off the boxes and you go to sleep. And then you wake up the next day and you put your hands in a box. How long do you think it would take for the incredibly flexible, delicate reconfigurability of your hands to start becoming compromised, right? When we put our shoes in, we know that like these great sports shoes that it's like 90% of proprioception gets lost when we, when we hop into a shoe, it's crazy. And so we're losing that, that ability um, that Steve Schaffer was talking about, that Margaret Mead was talking about, every time we put our foot into a shoe, perhaps. Yes, indeed. Well. I think I see Lisa's hand up. Do you wanna go ahead, Lisa? Yeah, so um, being from Canada, we have winter and other. <laughs> has seasons and when it's not winter everybody goes to wearing as little on their feet as they can so flip-flops here so we go from these boots um to nothing and i know i have a foot issue right now and i know one other person here from canada has a foot issue and I'm wondering if part of the issue is that that quick transition over because it's either boots or flip flops. And we try to um, wear our flip flops as long as we can into the winter season, believe it or not. We sometimes wear them with socks. 
Um, and so we go from one extreme to the other extreme and bah, you just have this, this foot that it's like, it's lost. There's, there's um, structure that's limiting and then there's nothing, not structure, support. Anyway, just yeah. my thoughts. You know, uh, it's, um, uh, let's just say a controversial point in terms of, like I know uh, wearing flip-flops isn't, isn't the same as minimalist or barefoot, but certainly like, you know, a couple of years ago, one of the issues around all of a sudden there was like tons of people who moved to um to barefoot or minimalist shoes and I don't want to name any brands but you know there was there was brands associated with um certain lawsuits because all of a sudden you had people who went from traditional shoes and then were going out and trying to do five to ten k in a minimalist shoe having not preconditioned the tissues and of course you are likely to get injured when you just go from one extreme to the other um so I know I mentioned in my um in my presentation do I feel that everyone should go to minimalist or barefoot no I don't because I think sometimes there's other issues that we need to um come back before we we consider footwear yes I do think train the foot yes I do think um you know uh work on things like the plantar intrinsic foot muscle strength go barefoot as often as you can around the house but do I think someone needs to go minimalist or or barefoot in running straight away no, and I think that can sometimes be a recipe for da- uh, disaster. And, you know, to kind of give the example I gave earlier, if you have someone who sits for eight hours a day and then thinks that a barefoot shoe is going to be the, you know, the creator of their um, move into optimal functional movement, then it's, we're misselling them information, aren't we? And I think we just need to be careful. I, I, you know, I do think I, I am pro minimalist footwear. I am pro um, barefoot. So I know uh, Stephen mentioned running barefoot. I, you know, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic thing, but I don't think it is something that everyone can do straight away. Definitely. Yes. Well said. Well, how are we doing chaps? Anybody else like to contribute? Well, this has been a, Oh, Carol, Carol Davis. Yes, um, I really appreciate this uh, conversation about um, barefoot versus flip-flops versus shoes. I lived in Florida uh, for 30 years, and so I was constantly uh, barefoot or in flip-flops. But I realized that when I had flip-flops on, my feet were doing something very different than barefoot. It wasn't the same at all. but then I, I developed this polyaxonal um, neuropathy, a motor um, neuropathy from my chronic Lyme. And something went haywire in the communication with my feet and my knees. And I, I heard, listened very carefully to what you said, Jennifer, about feet being informers. Because it, 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 it developed over time, even though I was a constant barefooter and loved going barefoot, it, it loved getting my feet hard in the summer, especially, and, and, and harder bottoms so that I could tolerate the sand and the gravel. What over time, what happened was that if my forefoot went down without my foot being flat, my knees collapsed and I would be down in a heartbeat. I, I wouldn't have, it was a neurological immediate collapse. I, I didn't have any time to catch myself. Over a period of about now five years, every fall that I've had on stairs or on flat surfaces, and I've had probably five or six major falls, have been due to this issue, that my foot for some reason goes down on my metatarsals rather than flat. So I've had to alter and and then I go down and land on a foot or, or a hip or my head. And I've had, to, I've had to really be very, very careful when I walk, which has changed my gait pattern totally. I used to love to walk at least three miles every day. And um, now I, I don't walk because I, I developed a fear associated with it that um, was, is very difficult. I was very naive. I used to teach fear of falling when I was a PT. I thought I understood how to prevent people from being afraid of falling but it becomes almost cellular. And so when people are talking about the neuromyofascial connection, 
and you talk about feet being informers to the rest of the system. I think that there's that's very, very powerful. And what I've taken from today's talk is I've got to spend a lot more time. I mobilize my toes. I talk to my toes. I, I mobilize my, my ankles and my feet. I've lost toe flexion totally, and I've lost my finger type finger flexors. So I'm constantly finding ways to adjust in a way that my whole body can respond. But I'm, the reason I'm saying all this is for those of you who are therapists out there, number one, don't, don't assume that you understand fear of falling because it's much more profound than anything I ever understood. It, it's almost cellular. And number two, that information chain is so quick and so automatic that you really have to pay close attention to and, and get the person to talk to you about what are, what are your feet telling you about yourself as you weight bear, as you heel strike or you planter strike or you, or you heel strike and roll off your metatarsals. What's the message that your hips are getting? What's the message that your body's getting to integrate that neurology with a myofascial unit and then find the fascial restrictions and release them too. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Carol. I think we're getting towards uh, winding things up, unless anyone has anything specific to say. I want to thank Jen Wilson so much for her work and Neil Galloway as well, because Jen, you're a, you're a pioneer in the, in the foot. Um, I saw it ever since I read your paper in 2016 that it was uh, so out there, so knowledgeable and just so much for us to think about, particularly with the terminology. So, um, I think if you would, uh, I'll talk a bit about next week. Uh, next week's um, tea party, we were looking at maths, art and biology with mathematics professor and author, Dana Tamina, an internationally noted science writer, artist and curator, Margaret Wertheim, who will be explaining how they can use art to learn about maths and how this relates to biology. So it'll be an interesting session again next week. For those of you who came late to the meeting today from the UK, uh, most of, offer our apologies. The clock times are different in the UK as they are to the rest of the world. So next week in the UK, we'll be back to normal 6 p.m. time. And the rest of you in the world will have to work out what those times are, I'm afraid. Um, so finally, I'll ask Jen Wilson to uh, offer a toast at the end of this biotensegrity tea party. Thank you to everyone who came to join us today and here is to shaking things up and challenging the uh, movement and therapy industries moving forward. Cheers. 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 Jing Jing. And before we go, I think Mariana wants to uh, yes. say gonna, a few words. I'm going to ask everyone um, to please help us share in this uh, order of my personal Facebook group. So I'm going to post the link on the comments of the uh, post from the archive. So if you can just please either copy that or click there after you're gone from this presentation and share that with the groups and the community that you feel it's, uh, it's worth it. Okay, that's going to help us spread this message even more. Thank you. Wait, Mariana, before I go, I was going to just go through our sponsors one more time. Yeah, before you do that, sorry, Mariana. So, what is that Facebook link for exactly? That's that's the the share of this meeting today in the archive uh, page. So okay. that link brings you to the archive page, and then from there we're sharing from the archive. Uh, the the archive the Facebook archive archive page, page yes on Facebook. Okay. Yes. Right. So we're asking our community to galvanize and help us get the word out there because it's an open field and we want to shake things up, like Jen says. So the more the merrier, there's uh, not, there's room, there's room. And we want to bring our communities together. Let me just uh, add a little bit here, because when you are on Facebook as a user, you have access to the groups that you belong to. So, so far I've been sharing to whatever I have access to that might not be all what is out there. 
probably is not, right? So if you have your own groups, then share that with them as well, okay? And before I turn off the YouTube live, those of you who are with us on YouTube, please also hit the subscribe button, share the videos. It helps us so much. And this is a community that's really growing and thriving. And every week when we meet together, it, it brings us so much pleasure. We're no longer isolated around the world, but we get this touch point with each other. So. If you could uh, take us away with the sponsors, Chris. Oh, right, sponsors. Okay, so our Biotensegra Tea Party is an all volunteer productions uh, uh, by the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive. And before I mention the sponsors, I just want to say a big thank you for our to our guest host, Neil Galloway. It's always a pleasure to have you here to Jen Wilson. I'm so excited to hear your, your talk and to just congratulate you on submitting your thesis. Yay, we look forward to seeing that those initials by your name once you go through the rest of that process. <laughs> and to our to my fellow co-hosts, Graham Scar, to Susan Lowell, who has joined us now, to our amazing team, Rachel Tudor, Lisa Babiak, Mariana Barreto. This community effort is so important. And I'm just gonna really quickly mention the sponsors, Embody Biotensegrity, that's the platform that I run. If you want to join us for the Trailblazers and the Tens Biolat workshop, Workshop registration closes on Sunday, and we have Integrated Biotensegrity out of Canada with Lisa Babiat, Paul Thornley, and Rachel Tudor getting ready to present a full day of offerings based around movement on November 7th. We also have the British Fascia Symposium, and I think I saw Jan here. Hi, Jan. And uh, this week, they've la they're launching the Fascial Hub I don't have the, the uh, link, but I think Jan will type it in the chat for us. I think it's fascialhub.com. Uh, yeah, that's it. We also have a big thank you for Artifact Pro of Madrid, Spain. A lot of you know Fernando. He's been here on our tea parties quite a bit, and his models are absolutely gorgeous. Finally, and Last not the least is Handspring Publishing of East Lothian, Scotland. Let's support our publishers. Hop on to their live with uh, Elizabeth Larkham when you can. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. And uh, hey, Lisa, can you put...